Hey folks, Nathan here. This time we're taking a look at a game that I am particularly fond of, but it's kind of an odd one in the sense that some of the materials went straight to retail and some of the newer materials came through Kickstarter. There is a first edition and a second edition, but the one currently being supported and focused on is the first edition. It's an interesting and eclectic mix for a game that in and of itself sort of meets that description as well. It's a game of influence and manipulation, as they call it, that I think really mirrors modern society very well in its dystopian cyberpunk type of future. The game is called Master of Wills, and it's from Stormcrest Games. We're going to take a look here at the first edition of the game and the second edition of the game. And in the process, by the way, with those, we are going to be doing a direct comparison of what cards are available for the different factions and different groups within each of these two editions, because yes, there are some card changes between the two. We're also going to take a look at the four current expansion factions. There is a fifth expansion faction currently on Kickstarter, which is why I figured I'd record this now. That faction on Kickstarter right now is called Blood Crown, all is one word. There is an eighth faction, a sixth expansion faction, coming in the future to round out the base game, as they call it. We then have the so-called Overlord Master of All, Overlord Game Variant, little mini expansion item here. Plus, each faction has what's referred to as a Fringe War Neutral pack for us to look at, and then we have some packs exclusive promo cards to take a look at. Our goal here is to look at the game, see how it works in general, take a look at the different products, make a comparison between first and second edition for those who are interested, which will be sort of near the end of the video here, and basically just kind of catalog things for someone who is a completist, like I am with Master of Wills. Let's get the general concept from the back of the first edition box. In the distant future, the world is a dangerous place where the balance of power rests between opposing forces. Warring factions push and pull the citizens of the community to join their side and vanquish the opposition. Master of Wills is a competitive two to four player game that pits two factions against each other. Players build their faction card deck to manipulate and influence sectors of the community to join their side. With each move, more community characters are drawn into battle and most will join one faction or the other. By expanding control over the community, power can be acquired. Choose a side and become the Master of Wills. The first edition box here notes this is a two to four player game. Two players is standard. You can go up to four with variants. There's also a variant for one player that is not noted here. This one at least says age 13 plus, and it should take about 25 to 45 minutes per game. It notes the contents here for the first edition. 120 community cards, 98 faction cards, two faction help cards, round token, game board, game guide. Notice here, by the way, 98 faction cards means 49 per faction of the two factions that are included. That was the standard size initially. Later with Edge Hunter in the second edition, it moved up to 50 cards per faction. We haven't seen that change yet for some of the factions, but the core game factions do get updated because, well, let's look at the second edition box. Not a lot more about the game here, but some altered components. Acquire power through manipulation and influence. A competitive and expandable card game that is easy to learn but hard to master. Customize your faction deck and strategy to dominate the opponent. Expand your control and become the master of wills. Doesn't really give you much information thematically about what's going on. It does note here that the second edition game contents include one round marker, game guide, five modular game tiles, 120 community cards, two faction help cards, and now 50 each of Razor Corp faction cards and Alpha Guard faction cards. What I find kind of funny here is that while it still says two to four players, even though the solitaire variant is included in the rule book, for second edition, so it should probably say one to four. We also have a change of age. For second edition, all of a sudden it's 14 plus instead of 13 plus, but the game time has changed 25 to 45 minutes originally to now 15 to 30 minutes. The game hasn't friggin' changed that much. It's a bit weird. Let me first note before we break out the first edition that underneath all of this that I'm gonna be sitting out here, we have a game mat for Master of Wills. And this game mat is very nice, has a stitched edge, it's easily rolled up, it's about the same size as the game board in the first edition, although it has shrunk down the columns just a little bit so there's a bit more of a border around it. This is available on their website, it's also available as an add-on to the current Kickstarter for Blood Crown. It's very nice, the cards don't get bumped around too much on this when they're not sleeved. Uh, I actually prefer playing on this to any of the other possible playing surfaces for the game. It's not necessary, but it's nice to have. So let's start our look into Master of Wills with where it all began in 2017, and that is with the first edition of the base game. 
This includes two factions, the Alpha Guard and Razor Corp faction, along with the so-called community cards and everything else you're going to need to play a two-player game. The rules are laid out here in the game guide, and it basically gives you a breakdown of the world that it's in, um, an introduction to the game, how to set it up, uh, anatomy of the various card types that we'll look at, how to play through individual turns and rounds, a bit about one variant, one variant only in this case, two versus two team play, which is what brings that up to a possible player count of four, and then we have the golden rules, like the things that just need to be remembered as playing. There are other variant game types, like a solo mode called Mao, as in Master of Wills, Mao or Moit Tear, which you can find on the Master of Wills website, masterofwills.com. It is also included in the updated game guide in the second edition. Now again, this is the game map, and this is the rather giant base game first edition board. It's very nice, very vibrant, brighter colors than what you'll get with the game mat, and places for everything that you're going to need here. A faction deck for both sides, the afterlife, which is where dead community cards wind up going, the community deck, which is where community cards will come from, you have the community area, which is where community cards come into, you have the recruits, loyalists, and allies on both sides, the recruit and loyalist columns each have a place for a lasting effect card, the community has a place to put round effect cards, we have a lock symbol on allies that will see the meaning of momentarily, and then we have a place to mark our rounds up there at the top. Everything we need to be able to play. We also have a little teeny tiny meeple that is used here to mark the individual game rounds. The game itself only lasts eight rounds with each player taking one turn per round alternating. Now, the first card type we're going to look at here are the community cards. There are 15 each from eight different sectors of the community. All 120 get shuffled and put into the community deck. Initially, to figure out who's going to get to choose who goes first, you draw out one of these and compare the values, and then when the highest value goes first, they immediately get killed and put into the afterlife, which is essentially the community discard area. Then at the beginning of the game, six of these community cards come out into the neutral community area. And then along the way, at the end of every individual player's turn, you'll have one more come from the community deck into the community, though other things can cause more to come out along the way. If at any point there are less than three at the end of a turn in a community, say there's one, you draw one and now there's two, still less than three, you're going to draw another until it is at at least three. There also has to be at least one that is able to be moved by the player whose turn is coming up. If it turns out that because of perhaps restrictions from other cards, they can't do so, such as maybe they're all of one particular sector and there's something happening that's causing that player to not be able to move that sector, you'll be able to draw more out as well to be able to get up to the point where they can do something. It doesn't allow a game-breaking stoppage of play. But you'll pull out your cards from your community deck, and they're going to look like this. They're going to have a colored border. Okay? It will have a point value up here. The point value is incredibly important because that is how you're going to win the game. These cards are going to be out here in the community, and you're going to wind up moving them around. They're shifting, vacillating back and forth from this neutral area where they count for no one into the recruits, loyalists, and allies on your side or recruits, loyalists, and allies on the opposite side. At the end of the game, after eight rounds, after each player has taken basically eight turns for 16 turns total, whichever side has the greatest point value total on their side among those three columns combined winds up winning the game. You're the master of wills. You're dominating this future society. That said, though, loyalists and recruits, they can shift. It's only once a character gets all the way over into allies that it gets locked in, hence the lock symbol, and cannot be moved or killed at that point. It's almost like football in that sense, constantly moving back and forth between the different end zones, but eventually one will get far enough to score. Only in this case, the scoring is for everything on your side of that central area here. So we got a point value. We also have a symbol, a color, and a name to represent the particular sector that this individual in the community is from, in this case, activists. The name underneath here with the colored background, in this case, silver, and the background of the area up here are going to tell us where this character goes when they are first moved, as we'll look at in a moment. We then have other symbols up here that are going to also come into play. We have a faction symbol, which allows a faction play, which uses your faction deck, which is the thing that you customize before playing the game. You have a community draw symbol, which can have more cards come out of the community deck into the community area. 
Then you have this numbered area that has plus and minus type numbers with symbols and colors for various sectors within the community. Then you have a name down at the bottom with some cool art. The name basically means nothing, neither does the art, but it looks pretty sweet. So the beginning of any turn is called the move phase. I've gone ahead and populated three more community members here, the Pagan Spiritualist, the Black Mage, and Virtual Lifer here for our example here of the move phase. And we've got our Anarchist that we looked at a moment ago as our example. So the first step is that a player finds some individual in the community, some card in the community, and chooses to move that card onto their side of the board. But where they move to is determined, again, by the background color of that top area and what it says underneath. So in this case, it's silver and says Loyalist. So to move him, I place him in Loyalist. That is his so-called starting position. When I move any of these characters, though, any of these community cards, I'm triggering all kinds of stuff happening up there at the top. In this case, we have a plus one in a black area, which represents the underground sector of the community. What plus one means is I'm moving one step towards my side of the board. In this case, that is one step for this black card here that now moves into recruits. Then he's got a negative three there for brown, which is religion. Now. We've got two religion cards here. I could take that minus three, which means moving away from me towards the other side, and I could move Black Mage all the way over here to allies, which locks him in, and then I can't ever move him away again from that allies area. That's locked in as 10 points for my adversary. I could also do the same thing here for Pagan Spiritualist and lock her in, which is going to cause him to lose three and not be able to get rid of it. But I also have the ability to break that up. It doesn't have to be three movements for the same card. So I could do, say, one, two, three, or vice versa. But I do have to use all the movements possible unless the cards just aren't there on the board. You have to move based on those numbers up at the top, the so-called movement area. Now, there's other symbols there, too. Anytime I move a card out of the community, now that's not through it, just out of it, if that was where it was starting, and it's got one of these little community draw symbols on it, that triggers something during the next phase of the turn, which is the draw phase. That's going to pull a new card out of the community deck into the community. And it's for any card that moved out of the community area during your move phase. So he's got the symbol, so that's one. She's got the symbol, that's two. He's got a symbol, that's three, she doesn't. For a total of three more community deck cards that are going to come out here during that draw phase as a result of that movement. On the other hand, the other symbol, the faction play symbol, only triggers based on the card that was initially moved. It doesn't matter if the symbol is on any of the other ones that moved as a result. He has that faction play symbol. That's going to let me draw one card from my faction deck and then play any faction card from my hand. So, what are these faction cards? Each faction has its own cards, in this case Alpha Guard. They have their own symbol and their own color. There's Alpha Guard there. The other ones for the core set for 1st edition and 2nd edition is Razor Corp. Conceptually, Alpha Guard is a leader in law enforcement. This elite force has been mobilized to take back control of the city. They focus on the offensive and card control. Razor Corp is a powerful corporation. They'll manipulate even the strongest opponent to advance their cause. They focus on defensive plays and counterattacks. Each faction comes with a little help card with different faction power symbols. These are just sort of shorthand symbols that are used on the faction cards to kind of let you know what they're going to do when you play them. Each faction then has six legendaries, at least in first edition, seven in second edition, as we will see. Legendaries always have kind of this gold, orange, yellowy border. The symbol for the faction up here says legendary, and then the faction name has the name of the card, has any symbols that help represent what it does, cool art, and some card ability. When you build your deck before the game, unless you're playing casually, in which case you just use all the cards shuffled together, you build your faction deck, and it can only have two legendaries total. No more, no less. That's what you're going to sort of build your strategy around. You then have 12 epic cards, essentially the same design, except silver. You're required to have only five of these, but exactly five of these in your faction deck. 
You then have 19 action cards to choose from. The background is always the color of your faction with the symbol, of course, up there. Everything else essentially the same. Uh, in this case, this is where you can actually vary the size of your faction deck because this could be anywhere from 8 to 18 action cards in your deck. And then finally, each faction has what are called neutral cards, 12 of them. They're always green background. They always have the faction symbol and still have the faction back on it, but they're the same card across all the factions, all 12 of these doing the same thing. You'll build five of these into every faction deck you build. So I'll have a faction deck up here. Initially at the beginning of the game, I draw three faction cards, but then when a card is moved out of the center area, as my card for my move phase, not as a result, but as the card that I chose to move, and it has that faction play symbol on it, it triggers my ability to draw one card out of my faction deck. And then I can play any card from my faction in my hand. It doesn't have to be the one that I drew. They all have some pretty cool things they do that are sort of like the big plays made by your faction to really kind of reshape the game, uh, with of course Legendary and Epic being the more powerful ones. Some of them will be lasting effects that actually go onto a row as a lasting effect card. The lasting effect cards affect typically that column, but they also can only be removed by special cards that remove them. They can't just have a new card played on top of them. They must be removed by a special remove card, which is one among your faction cards. You also have some that are labeled as round effect, which will go down here in the round effect area, typically sideways, but you might want to put them like this just to be able to read the friggin' things. But they go in the round effect area. There's an unlimited number of them that could be in play at any given time, but they only typically affect that round, except for a few that purposely stick around for effects later on, like, say, at the end of the game. But the game essentially boils down to this. You and your faction are trying to bring members of the community onto your side to have the most points at the end. You're hoping to get many into allies, if you can, to lock them in. However, every time you move one, there's going to be some type of secondary effect. Movement of other cards is pretty much guaranteed. Also, it could draw more members of the community out into play. It could wind up letting you do a faction play with a faction card. And those faction cards are those big events that you can use to sort of manipulate the situation. It's essentially presenting an opportunity for that faction play. Now, thematically, I love this game, but I'm a social studies teacher. I teach history classes, economics classes, government slash poli sci classes. I've taught constitutional law before. This stuff is right up my alley because it really sort of gives a cool representation of society in a way that I hadn't really seen in a game before. I'm sure that this type of tug of war type thing exists out there. It's just something I hadn't necessarily dipped myself into before. But what the idea is, to me, thematically, is this whole concept that getting someone onto your side in a particular debate, on a particular issue, uh, as far as dominating a country, dominating a society, a planet, whatever, it's always going to have these influences on others. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. If I pull someone over to our side of an issue, that could not only cause people who perhaps admire them, respect their opinion, uh, are related to them, whatever, to also come towards my side, but could also wind up having the opposite effect on others if perhaps it's a very controversial figure that pushes people away towards the opposite extreme. I think of this kind of like, gosh, I don't know, uh, if we think of, of modern day politics, to use some very divisive figures as examples, let's take, uh, say, a Donald Trump or a Nancy Pelosi, right, representing the leadership of either of the major political parties in the U.S. right now. If Donald Trump were to move toward a particular side on a particular issue, there will be some who, because of Trump, will follow along with him because he's the one leading. The flip side, there will be some who, because it's him leading on that issue, will go the opposite direction, specifically because they don't like him. Same thing with Nancy Pelosi leading the Democrats. She could go in a direction that drives others away or brings others with her. That's just the nature of politics. And the idea that you can have someone who sways to your side but then gets pushed back and forth that's how society tends to go, right? Most people in a society aren't ideologically linked and locked into one party or another. Things just sort of happen that shift them back and forth on the issues. Eventually, someone could get locked into one side or the other. I think of this as an example with uh, Senator Ted Cruz in the United States, someone who 
was typically kind of over to one side of the, let's say that the issue is uh, Donald Trump and supporting him or not. For a while there, in the presidential primaries in 2016, he's very anti-Trump. Okay? Trump winds up getting the nomination. He starts moving a little bit closer to Trump, but Trump keeps saying things about him that causes him to be kind of wishy-washy, like the idea that, you know, Ted Cruz's dad helped assassinate JFK or something. But kind of going back and forth. Trump says something, maybe he moves this way, but then he wants to support the nominee, so he moves back that way. He's back and forth and back and forth until now. Trump becomes president. He realizes his key way of actually maintaining his Senate seat is to kind of toe the line. And all of a sudden, all of his anti-Trump talk goes away. He's locked in to the allies' side. And you can say the same thing with other individuals, say with Bernie Sanders locking himself into supporting Hillary Clinton when he had been so much against her previously. The idea is that whatever society you look at, whatever government you look at, whatever issue you look at, constantly people in the middle are being swayed one way or the other. And it takes not just the movement of the movers and shakers, the factions involved, the Republicans, Democrats, the whoever's, to push them to one side or the other. It's also how others move on the issue that influences the people around them who look up to them, who follow them in the news, etc. It's this ripple effect of public opinion. And I love that concept as represented here in the game. And you can think of the faction plays as those moments of opportunity that allow a group to step up and take the moment and seize it to make a game-changing move. One example of this I would say, and this is a bad example, I know, um, but an example that you see in the United States, unfortunately all too often, is something like a school shooting. It is immediately after a school shooting that you typically wind up seeing a big movement towards gun control or Second Amendment rights. That clash becomes much more vocal, much more of a lively debate after a tragedy like that. So in essence, that's kind of what these faction cards are doing, taking advantage of a situation where some move has caused an opening for them to do something dramatic in the situation that perhaps they couldn't have done if they hadn't moved a particular individual to their side of the debate. Aha, this person is with us. Now is our time to speak out on this. Aha, this person is on our side. They provide access that lets us do such and such. Uh, this is a golden opportunity type moment. There's so much just societal tension and development that is represented around us every single day, particularly in the politically divided times that we live in, that a game like this that takes us out of the real world context and lets us kind of use those types of ideas for this kind of cool tug of war type game as characters are moving back and forth. Because again, those movements are just move a member of that community in that particular direction, that many spaces among the cards you choose to move. If he moves now as his starting point over to Loyalists and the black underground has to move, well, Here's that black bordered underground card. Now it's moving here. But the Browns would continue moving that way, right? It's this idea that it's a constant tug of war as they go back and forth. Having that represented in a game like this makes for a really cool, unusual game, a fun game, a very strategic game, a game that's easy to learn, kind of tough to master as the saying goes, but which also does what great sci-fi tends to do. It takes a concept that is important in modern day conceptually uh, in the broader society around us and takes it into a sci-fi setting, in this case, sort of a dystopian cyberpunk future, to let us kind of play around with those ideas and have fun with it, while still having sort of a deeper subtext to it that's very interesting for those who want to delve into it without necessarily offending anybody, because the parties involved are these future individuals who don't exist in real life. Just like, you know, let this be our last battlefield, perhaps with Star Trek, and so on and so on. Lots and lots of sci-fi does symbolism well, it's rare to see that kind of symbolism heavy in some game forms, and this captures the symbolism, captures the concept very, very well. Even if you hate politics, you'll still get a kick out of this. But if you love following politics and the daily sort of tug of war on issues, and you want to get some escapism yet still have your interest reflected in your fun, Master of Wills is fantastic at doing that. Now, let's stick with core sets and let's look at the second edition. We will be looking at all the individual cards kind of spread out on the table here uh, later on to be able to compare the first edition and second editions of Master of Wills. But looking ahead, just so you know, if you're interested in seeing details of every single card in the game, that is every single card in first edition, in second edition, and every single card in the digital game, because yes, there is an app version of this game, 
But bear in mind that one does use microtransactions, whereas the physical game is more like an LCG model where every pack has the same stuff in it pretty much. You can go on the masterofwills.com website and they have a cool gallery that lets you see all of them. That's why we're not going to focus on flipping through every single card as I often do with something like a Kickstarter overview. Let's take a look at second edition. The first edition came out in 2017. The second edition came out in 2019, but was funded through a Kickstarter alongside their most recent expansion, which was the faction expansion for Edge Hunter. Now, again, currently there is a Blood Crown one going on, a Blood Crown Kickstarter campaign here near the end of January 2020. What we have learned is that the first edition is the one that they're going to continue supporting going forward. That will be their main set. In fact, it's offered as an add-on on the Blood Crown Kickstarter that's currently going. The second edition is kind of a weird aberration because the second edition was created in conjunction with their previous publisher who really wanted a more portable version of the game rather than the big old box that is needed to fit that big old game board. The second edition does have some changes to it that makes it worthwhile. We're going to look here at what those changes are and then we'll go into great detail about changes of cards near the end of the video. That way those who don't care don't have to sit through it. Here's our second edition here. Master of Wills, Game of Influence and Manipulation. We have an updated, smaller, more booklet-style game guide, much nicer looking, frankly, that gives you a breakdown of the components, the gameplay area, setup, breakdown of the uh, individual cards again, how to play, different phases. But then in game variants, it's not just two versus two, which is included here, but also that solitaire version I was telling you about, plus a three-player free-for-all, or Mao op which is cooperative play. Then the back offers a nice quick guide with the golden rules, faction power icons and what they mean, just like those little help cards, except without little explanations by them, and a reminder of the phases of play. Again, it's move, where you move a card out of the community and then deal with all the ramifications of it. The draw phase is then when you're drawing from the community deck based on the little symbols on the cards that move from here outward somewhere. And then you have the faction symbol that kicks in for the faction phase to play from your faction deck. And then the end of turn phase where, again, you draw one more out into the community and draw up to three if there's not three already. Personally, I much prefer this version of the guide. It's slicker looking. Um, it's better organized in my opinion. And I like the fact that the solitaire version and co-op versions are built into the rulebook. But you can download this on their website as well. Now, one huge change is the board because it doesn't actually exist as a board in second edition. Again, the idea was to make it more portable. Instead, it's what's referred to as a modular board. So we have these little pieces here for our two sides that we would simply set up to tell us which side is which. And we have this board, it says neutral area, which is where our community will be, community deck, the afterlife, and our eight spots there to mark rounds. So it's kind of replacing stuff up here, putting these to the side of it. I'm leaving these purposely on top of each other so you can sort of see what represents what. And then at the very bottom of the board, you're going to place these boards. Okay, one for either side, round effect goes on the outside. It says lasting effect, one card per row, round effect, multiple cards allowed, like so, in essence. Okay, just lined up top and bottom. The idea being that lasting effect is still in the recruits and loyalists on either side. Round effect is now moved to the outside to allies, which can't have a lasting effect placed on it. And now there's a spot for both sides to put theirs down. Then you've got your recruits, loyalists, and allies noted with the lock symbol and the directions put on both. You still have your afterlife, you still have your community deck, you still have your round tracker. You now have a different shaped, larger meeple to track your round. But notice you don't have a spot for your faction deck for either side. Those just stay near the players. They also suggest an alternative method, which is essentially having these laid out like so, but then taking these and instead of putting them at the bottom, putting them up here and then just have your rows going down, which does offer the nice benefit that there's no limit to how long those columns can get, so you don't necessarily have the cards overlapping each other, which is nice. Uh, this also, if you combine it with the regular board, can allow you to play 
uh, with more players, which is cool. But a lot of folks were not fond of this idea of a modular board, so they are going with any of the ones now. Any new releases will have the full board, like the first edition does, and they immediately, well, almost immediately, started offering that uh, play mat as another option for players who don't have first edition but want something that is a solid single piece, whereas the second edition has one made up of these five individual pieces. Second edition does come with all of your community cards, but some of them have been updated or swapped out, though functionally they're all very, very similar. It's just a slight rebalancing, and it comes with Razor Corp and Alpha Guard factions just like the first edition did, though there are also cards in here slightly tweaked, though in most cases it's just symbols, and then some cards that are straight up pulled out and then replaced. Again, we'll look at that in great detail later in the video. One other thing I would note here, you can barely see it here on the video, but the colors are a bit more vibrant for some of the borders on first edition compared to second. There's a first edition rather bright red for government and a more subdued one for government in second edition. And then the browns are significantly different between first and second edition. That's a way you can tell the editions apart. The editions do not have any identifying markers to tell you which edition each card actually comes from. And yes, those slight changes in coloration do also appear up there at the top as well, so you can use that to sort of tell them apart. The best way to tell them apart is the masterofwills.com website looking at the cards or the guide I'm going to give you here at the end of the video. Since the game's initial debut, they've added four more factions into the game, uh, all with sort of different play styles, and two, adding some interesting brand new mechanics into the game. We have Dawnlight and Shadow Cell, the initial two from 2018. Cloud Echo, also for 2018, but funded through a Kickstarter. There's a limited edition of this and a regular version of this that we'll talk about. Then we have Edge Hunter that fulfilled in 2019. This is the one funded alongside the second edition. Conceptually, for Dawnlight, they're the spiritual leaders who try to achieve angelic states through technology. They focus on board control and card movement. Shadow Cell is the faction of the night. Deception and surprise is their method, so they focus on manipulation and hidden cards. Then Cloud Echo, kind of like the sentient machines of Master of Wills. Their backstory, sentient echoes have risen. Destruction or tranquility will determine their future. They focus on icon combinations and value shifting, icon combinations being something new. Then we have Edge Hunter, powerful Greylanders who have evolved to manipulate the elements. They have elemental powers, also something new, and a lot of risk versus reward. We're not going to go through every card in these because there's no need to make a comparison between different editions of these. These only exist in one form so far. Color-wise, though, whereas Alpha Guard is blue, Razor Corp is red, we have purple for Dawnlight, green for Shadow Cell, but a darker green than the neutral cards. We have this sort of steel gray slash silver for Cloud Echo, but it is darker than the silver used for Epics. And then we have this sort of orangish reddish background color for the Edge Hunters, which is again a darker orangish color than what we see with Legendaries. Then of course they each have their own card back color, right? Purple, green, gray, and orange, and each have their own symbol to go with it that'll be found on their cards, including their neutrals and so on. And the Cloud Echo faction is interesting. Uh, this is their little help card. The help cards for Shadow Cell and Dawnlight are essentially the same as for Alpha Guard and Razor Corp back in first edition, but for Cloud Echo, you get all the symbols here without explanations or anything, because on the back, they give you some background on the faction, but then a new power and play style. This is actually the set that introduced that card effect symbol. The card effect symbol we will see is on the second edition help cards, but not on the first edition ones. But there are two different ways that Cloud Echo could go because of the different mindsets, if you want to call it that, of the different factions within the faction, the sub-factions. Serenity and Animus. Essentially, some cards will be marked with Animus or Serenity symbols, and once one of them is in play actually on the board, say as a lasting effect or a round effect or whatever, other cards could wind up being played that reference those symbols to pull off special abilities. Now, I would note here one somewhat frustrating thing about Cloud Echo right now. Cloud Echo had this version, which is the regular version. They're all marked as first edition, limited edition right now because they're just the only printing out there. But there was a limited edition or collector's edition version of this with a different 
cover art, and it includes one extra card, hollow foil, I believe, that you can't find anywhere else in the game, called Epsilon V, or version 3.14. I don't have that in my collection right now. I expect to actually have that later. I've been very blessed by the fact that the creators of this game tend to very much support those who also are supportive of the game. And uh, the game's creator actually noted the other day while I was commenting on the Kickstarter and helping others with information about the game that they have a couple of the limited editions or whatever you want to call them still sitting there uh, at their office and that they are going to send me one of those when I get my pledge for the Blood Crown Kickstarter campaign so that I'll have that for my collection and be able to show you that then. As of right now, though, can't show it to you, but just know there is one card in just the collector's edition version of this, or limited edition, whatever you want to call it, version of this, that's not in the regular one. And that special other version is really hard to find. Edge Hunter also introduces some new concepts here, new powers and effects. They're where the instant play icon comes from. Basically, instant play is the ability to, when you draw from your faction deck, that one card when you're making your faction play during that third phase of the turn, if the card you moved in the move phase has that faction play symbol on it, when you draw that card, if you instantly play it, not only do you get to play that card, but you get to draw another to replace it. Whereas typically you would draw one, it would go into your hand, you would play one of those cards, but you're not then instantly replacing it. This one allows it for some cards. Very much like what happened with Cloud Echo. You have different symbols that you'll see on some cards that are out in play, and then other cards will reference them if you then play them, and the fact that the other cards are sitting there on the table cause a special effect. We have Ignis Mastery, Aqua Restoration, Terraforma, and Ventus Control as the symbols here, basically fire, water, earth, and air. You might recall, though, I said these focus on risk versus reward. So this is Ventus Control, okay? So instantly place face up in the round effect after drawn, unless you have an elemental card in play. If a faction, as a faction card, with that symbol is played, draw one community card and place in the neutral area. If the drawn card is less than four in terms of its value, the opponent may swap one of their cards for one neutral area card. If it's between four and eight, swap one card with one neutral area card, but it's you doing the swapping. If it's more than eight, swap one opponent card with any card on your side. So two beneficial things and one negative thing that could happen based on what card is drawn and the value of it. Uh, it can also be swapped with a different elemental card at the end of the turn. You may only have one elemental card active at a time. They are all, all marked as elemental up here just to remind you of it. And of course they have their symbols. There's that instant place symbol there. You can think of these and the core set as essentially an LCG model. Same cards every single time. Even when you get this version versus that collector's edition, that version has all the same cards. The other edition always has all the same cards plus that one extra Epsilon version 3.14 card. You're never buying blind booster packs for this game. But there's something kind of like a cross between a blind booster pack and an LCG pack that we'll see, and that is the set of Fringe War Neutral Packs. Those are these down here at the bottom. We have one per faction, Alpha Guard and Razor Corp, again from 1st edition or 2nd edition core set, either way, Dawnlight, Shadow Cell, Cloud Echo, and Edge Hunter. Now these are Fringe War Neutral Packs. What do we know about the word neutral? In this case, it means that they're the same cards for each faction. However, remember, in order to play them in your deck, they have to have a card back that matches your faction. So they can't just sell you one pack of cards that'll work in all the different decks here. Instead, it's the same 12 cards as they apply to that faction, meaning that they'll have that specific faction back. They also up the value by having one hollow card or hollow foil card added into each pack as a 13th card. That hollow foil card is entirely random other than the fact that it is from that particular faction. Now, what has become somewhat frustrating to some is the fact that for Alpha Guard, Razor Corp, Dawnlight, and Shadow Cell, but not Cloud Echo or Edge Hunter, not only could the Hollow Foil card be one random card from that faction, it could also be one very special limited edition card that is not just Hollow Foil, but a card that is unique 
to the holofoil that does not exist otherwise in the game. Not in the core set for Alpha Guard or Razor Corp, not in the faction expansions for Shadow Cell or Dawnlight. The only way to get that card is to get really lucky when you get it in that Fringe War neutral pack as your holofoil card. Now, if that seems very frustrating, take heart here a little bit, because for Alpha Guard and Razor Corp, the cards in question were Vapor and Dark Scar. Both of those got regular versions among the cards that were swapped in and out between first edition and second edition. So if you have the second edition, you've got Vapor and Dark Scar, just non-foil versions. If you have first edition, you do not have them, but you might have found them as foils inside the Fringe War packs. For Dawnlight, it's a card called Pressure. For Shadow Cell, it's a card called The Watcher. These have not gotten second editions yet, so as of now, the only way to have those is to have the foil versions if you got very, very lucky with that one random card, because you're not going to buy these over and over again. The other cards are always exactly the same, like an LCG model. It's just that one card that could be different and foil. However, in the Kickstarter that's going on right now for Blood Crown, the seventh faction for the game, they're also offering an add-on that will then be available later as well called the Core Faction Expansion Set. That Core Faction Expansion Set is going to include all of the new cards for Alpha Guard and Razor Corp that were introduced into the second edition of the game, which means that also includes Vapor and Dark Scar, the ones that were previously only Holofoil, plus some more extra cards, and it's including new cards for Dawnlight and Shadow Cell as well, the so-called Core Factions, and among those new cards will be Pressure and the Watcher, the previously only holofoil cards. So you don't necessarily need to hunt down the holofoil card. Cloud Echo and Edge Hunter have never had a holofoil only randomly inserted card that's only found in the Fringe War neutral packs. That was only something for those original four factions. As for what cards you get, again, for every single faction, if you want to see them in detail, check out the masterofwills.com website. You have 12, and again, it's the same card across all of the different factions. We have Sleight of Hand, Bladestorm, Architect, Safeguard, Paradigm Shift, Negotiator, Breath of Life, Lunatic Fringe, Cruel Inquisition, Mechanized, Devil's Advocate, Immortal, and some foil card for the faction, which for me is that really cool Ventus Control, which is one I really like, so I thought it was pretty cool that that wound up being my holofoil. And one thing that you will see when you look at Edge Hunter that's a little bit different is a change to some of the card uh, layout in that lasting effects now have a little notation that is a lasting effect that is missing on any cards before second edition or Edge Hunter. And when it comes to round effects that already had a notation down at the bottom for most of them, if they already had that notation, they removed the symbol from the list of power symbols here. But otherwise, it's all the same cards. One thing I would note, though, is that while Edge Hunter doesn't have any of those elemental symbols anywhere on any of their neutral cards, the ones for Cloud Echo do have the Animus and Serenity symbols on some of those new neutrals from the Fringe War neutral pack. And if I could take a moment to dispel some false information out there, again, remember, the Fringe War neutral packs always come with one foil card that is from any of the cards for that faction. Could be from the first edition, could be from a faction expansion, could be from that very same Fringe War neutral pack. It just has to be from that same faction, or it could be one of those special ones that I mentioned before. But just because something is a foil card out of one of those packs does not, 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 make it into some type of special promo card. You'll see a lot of times where cards like Bladestorm that is foil out of one of those Fringe War neutral packs being put up on eBay as if it is some type of special promo card. It is not. Yes, the promo cards that do exist are foil, but just because it is foil does not make it a promo card. Don't get suckered. In fact, let's look at the real promo cards right now. There are only two promo cards that exist for Master of Wills as of January 2020. Those two promo cards were both from the PAX Gaming Convention and are PAX exclusive cards. Now, I said two, you see eight here. Why? Because they are neutral cards and they were out there when only the original four core factions existed which means that for each one, in order to be fully playable, there must be a Dawnlight Shadow Cell, Alpha Guard, and Razor Corp version of that promo card. 
those two promo cards, which exist only as foil, are Drifter and Headhunter. That's it. And they're marked as PAX Limited Edition. If anyone tries to sell you a Master of Wheels promo card that is foil, that's not Headhunter or Drifter, they're wrong. Or they're purposely lying. Those are not promo cards. Those are just hollow foils randomly inserted into a Fringe War Neutral pack. And yeah, they may say limited edition because it could be Prussia, The Watcher, Vapor, or Dark Scar. But still, those aren't promo cards. These are the only promos, and they say packs. Lastly, before we look at the different changes between first and second edition cards, both in the community and in the factions, let's take a look at the Master of Wills Overlord, Master of All, Overlord game variant pack here. It is one guide card and 20 Overlord cards that introduce an interesting new element to gameplay. I pretty much never play without Overlord anymore. All the card backs for this particular set are Overlord Master of All, so different looking card backs. The concept here is this. With Nova City in chaos from the ongoing faction wars and the government authority removed, an opening was created for a powerful force to sweep in and take over control of the weakened community. This new regime, led by a charismatic and powerful figure known only as the Overlord, took the city by storm and within weeks had turned the community against the factions. This blindside hit the factions hard and forced them to reevaluate their strategies. The Overlord must be dealt with before things get out of hand. These are the cards for that Overlord Master of All variant pack. You have a little rule sheet here, gives you the game rules, and on the back gives you, again, a little bit more about how to play, plus an explanation for the color coding of the other cards. These 20 cards here, these are the Overlord cards. Each round is going to be affected by a different Overlord card. You take all 20, you shuffle them together. You start out the game by pulling out your six community cards into the community to begin with. Each player is going to draw one of the community cards out of the community deck and see who has the higher value in order to figure out who gets to choose who goes first. Once that's all done, that part of setup is done, then you pull an Overlord card for round one. And then when the last player taking a turn in a round, or the second player, taking a turn in a round, in a standard game at least, finishes their turn, the last step after drawing that community card that's required at the end of every turn must pull out a new Overlord for the next round. There'll be eight Overlords played in a standard game, but if you have some type of card that goes into play that extends the number of rounds in the game, yes, you keep having new Overlords each round. The 20 possible Overlords are Execution, Contagion, Revival, Betrayer, and Allied. Those are community master cards that affect the game by drawing new cards or killing community cards. Then you have Holiday, Paradox, and Outlaw. Those are faction influence overlords. They influence faction plays positively or negatively. Then we have the Purple, Dragon, Gridlock, Blackout, Frenemies, and Crazy Eights. Those are board control overlords. They restrict the player or board with new control mechanics. And then you have all these green ones over here, which are the Move Manipulation Overlord cards that adjust movements, starting card values, and move-related events. For those, we have Speed Zone, Fire Choir, I love that title, by the way, Reprogram, Star Pupil, Curfew, Party Time, and Muster. It's a really cool little way to get a relatively inexpensive product that's going to change up your Master of Will games quite a bit. If the regular different variants of the game and the standard game with all these different factions wasn't enough for you. All right, folks, so you know what's out there. The first edition, the second edition, the four faction expansions, Dawnlight, Shadow Cell, Cloud Echo, and Edge Hunter, with Cloud Echo having that special edition with the one extra card in it. There are Fringe War neutral packs for all six factions, which contain that random holofoil card, but otherwise the same 12 neutral cards for each faction. There is the Overlord pack you can get, there is the game map that you can get, and there are those PAX exclusive holofoil promo cards. There's also the, currently the Kickstarter going for the Blood Crown Faction expansion, also with the Blood Crown Fringe War Neutral Pack included. That is also so far the only place where you can get the add-on called the Core Faction Expansion Set, as mentioned before, which includes the new faction cards introduced for the second edition, including regular versions of Vapor and Dark Scar that were previously holofoil exclusive only through those random inserts, plus a bunch of other new cards, including new cards for Shadow Cell and Dawnlight. But I've mentioned a few times here how there are different cards in some cases between 1st edition and 2nd edition. What we will find is that community cards have been tweaked generally. You have a few that are all exactly the same. 
You have a few where they have changed essentially the stats up at the top, so they play a bit differently, but it's essentially the same card in terms of art and name. You have some cases where they've just changed the name but kept the card essentially the same, or they've swapped out a card essentially completely. But when they do that, it's essentially taking one card that has a specific value and specific things that it does, swapped out for another card that is the same value and the same number of copies of that card, and maybe with the movement and symbols up at the top changed, but maybe not. Currently, the only way to get the updated different community cards for Master of Wills second edition is to get the second edition. Also, there are some minor tweaks to the layout of some of the faction cards for Alpha Guard and Razor Corp, but then there are also some cards that have been removed from first edition with new cards inserted for second edition. The new cards inserted for second edition are in the core faction expansion set as well, so you can get those without having second edition. Now is when we're going down the rabbit hole. Let's take a look, starting with the community, at all the changes you can find in the cards between first and second edition. Again, if you want to see them in detail, check out the masterofwills.com website. Anything marked board game V1 is from first edition, board game V2 is from second edition. There's also the online game, which has its own section of cards you can take a look at, which tends to be a mixture of the two, whatever fits balanced online gameplay best. This is the union sector of the community. We have first edition cards in the top row, second edition in the bottom row. The old union grunt, machina repairman, locomotion engineer, collector, telekinesis operator, and union boss are all essentially unchanged here. Then we have the union guardian who's had some tweaks to the numbers up at the top. We then have night watchman replaced by high rider, and we have the tinkerer replaced by skin carver. This is the entertainer sector of the community. Struggling actress and energy dancer stayed the same. We have some changes to the stats up at the top for dream dealer, Esports Hero, Gravity Racer, Visual Artist, and Hollow Fighter. Then we have two replacements, Dominatrix replaced by Exotic Robotic, and Optical Skin Inker replaced by Dream Smuggler. This is the corporation sector of the community. The ones that have stayed the same are the Investment Broker, Ruthless CEO, and Visionary Officer. Then we have some stat changes for Mysterious Informant, The Entrepreneur, Corporate Henchman, and Executive Assistant. Then we have two replacements again, this time Master Technologist replaced by The Mascot and Inside Trader replaced by Clone Rancher. Here we have the Activist sector of the community. Unchanged, we have Anarchist, Climate Changer, Survivalist, and Fortune Teller. Then the ones that have some stat changes, we have Preservationalist, Fundraising Socialite, and Radical Atheist. And then the two that have been swapped out in this case, Animal Rights Lioness swapped out for Dismantler, and then Park Ranger swapped out for Scavenger. Again, not exact swaps, but close enough to be analogous and for us to know which ones were swapped out for which. This is the religion sector of the community, and it has some odd changes. Some things where the names were changed, but otherwise they stayed the same, instead of having the stats necessarily change, in other cases having art swapped around. I almost wonder if with the first edition there were people who were offended by some aspect of the way that the religion sector was handled, causing them to make some changes, or if they just thematically thought there were some other ways to approach this terminology-wise as a way that would make better sense in their growing continuity. Of course, not that it matters now, because the first edition is the one that will continue to see print. But here's our comparison. First edition, second edition. We have New Age Cardinal that stays the same, along with Exalted, Paragon, Brutish Fundamentalist, an ancient priest. Then we have some changes, but the changes are effectively just to names for Wisps of the Forgotten that become Forgotten Wisps, an Archdeacon of Shadows who becomes just Deacon of Shadows. Then we have a, kind of an odd set of changes here. We have Learned Shaman, whose stats stay the same and instead become Mystic Soothsayer with new art. But then for the next card, we have Pagan Spiritualist, swapped out for the Shaman, except the Shaman now has the art from the old Learned Shaman. And then we have just a straight card swap here for the Black Mage and Foreteller of Light. Then this is the underground sector of the community. We have Dream Junkie, Raver, and Brilliant Hacker that have stayed the same. 
Then we have changes made to the stats for illusionist, eccentric barista, and reprogrammer. Then we have three swap outs. Virtual lifer goes out to bring in Ripper Doc. Spatial, not special, but spatial, cyborg DJ is gone, replaced by Wirehead, and homeless guy is replaced by Gutter Punk. This is the law enforcer sector of the community. And here we have unchanged undercover Merc, the commissioner, Tactical Commando, Street Enforcer, and Mech SWAT Bot, along with Bounty Hunters, all unchanged. But then we have one that's had some stat tweaks, that is Ace Detective. You can barely see it here, but all they've basically done is they swapped out that first stat of minus one. In the original game, it caused a minus one to the religion sector. Here, it's to the underground sector, but otherwise it's unchanged. Then we've got Stealth Agent replacing Fem Ops FEM, Ops Special Agent, and Alpha Protector replacing DEA Infantry. Notice that with Stealth Agent and Fem Ops Special Agent, it's just a change of name, not of art. And finally, the last of the community sectors, Government. Unchanged are Military Commander, Judicial Examiner, Honorable Senator, Foreign Ambassador. Changed, but keeping their same name and art, Mayor of the People, an exo peacemaker along with trader of secrets. Then with identical stats but a changed name, we have fire chief becoming burn overseer, and they would change stats and name and art but swapped out. Keeper of records is gone in place of propagator of deports. Yeah, deports, like deportation, I guess. Propagator of deports. Now every faction starts out with 12 neutral cards to be able to pull from. Each player's deck, unless you're playing casual, must have exactly five of these of any kind in their deck. But again, they're the same for all the factions, so it allows sort of some balancing out here. The cards in question are Time Bomb, Black Mirror, Finding Faith, Inventor, F the Man, Special Delivery, Social Rebellion, Mousetrap, Profitable Venture, Game of Chance, Killing Spree, and Refaction. Not Refraction, but Refaction. Now, something to note here. There's not a big change between 1st edition and 2nd edition when it comes to these. The biggest difference is that Time Bomb, which is a round effect but is expected to stick around until the end of the game, now has its round effect symbol up in the corner replaced for 2nd edition by a lasting effect symbol. And all the cards, except for Game of Chance, Killing Spree, and Refaction, are lasting effects. And they now have a little notation here at the top to help remind you that it is a lasting effect that is absent for first edition. I would note here that aside from that small change to time bomb and the lasting effect notice on most of the cards, the actual cards involved, the names of the cards and generally what they do are unchanged between first and second edition in this case. Now within the Alpha Guard faction, let's take a look here at their actions. What you see here are the cards from the first edition that are in the second edition as well. These 11 here, that's Banishment, Give and Take, Head of the Snake, Kill and Advance, Kill and Restore, Last Rites, Population Control, Russian Roulette, Advance Your Cause, Mobilize, and Manipulator. All are the same between 1st and 2nd edition. However, there are two cards here that aren't totally replaced, but do get tweaked for 2nd edition. Hard Freeze, which is an Alpha Guard action, has a round effect noted here, and the symbol for round effect up here on the first edition, whereas the second edition removes that round effect symbol because it is also down here, presumably to unclutter the card. Whereas Population Surge essentially stays the same, but the artwork has changed. This is the second edition Population Surge. My guess is this was because Population Surge and Kill and Restore were pretty similar art originally. There are also six cards from first edition that were removed and entirely replaced for second edition. So both editions have six different action cards from each other. The first edition had Blackmail Strike, Anonymous Ally, Political Strike, Power Strike, Sacrificial Lamb, and Believer Strike. Whereas the second edition has Hero's Anthem, Irresistible Charm, Oath of Mending, Pledge of Fortune, Reinforcements, and Witness Protection. For Alpha Guard Epic, cards, there are basically nine that don't get replaced between first and second edition, though two of them have a familiar tweak. 
So we have Criterion, Silent Wave, The Loyal Gentleman, The Enticer, and The Allied Soldier. And I would note that in some cases we have art that's perhaps either recentered or zoomed in. That is the case with Criterion and Loyal Gentleman that are slightly more zoomed in for second edition, but same cards. We have Proxy and Community Guardian. And then there are two with small changes, which is Steel Moonfall and Life Dealer. Again, it's just like what we saw previously, where we have a round symbol here, a round effect symbol up here, but it's also noted here, so they drop that symbol, but leave that part. Then also for Alpha Guard Epics, we have three in first edition and three in second edition that are only found in their editions. It was a swap out again. We have in first edition, Silverblade, Transference, and Random Ranger. And then in second edition, we have Amnesia, Mongoose, and Flix. Then here are our Alpha Guard legendaries. First edition on top, second edition on bottom. Blueburn is the only one that's basically the same. Then Prisma and Quattro are again basically the same game-wise, but their art is completely changed. Uh, the look of Quattro is completely changed. Prisma's changed races. We then have three that are completely swapped out, Mystic Imager, and Reversi and Echo Strike up there for the first edition, but then the second edition has Cobalt, Maven, and Echo Purge. But then the second edition adds one more card to the Alpha Guard, and they add one more card, by the way, to Razor Corp, and it's a pretty important card. That card is Vapor. Vapor previously only could be found as the random hollow foil only card within the Alpha Guard Fringe War Neutral Pack. So the only way to have Vapor prior to the second edition was to be incredibly lucky and find her as a hollow foil in that pack instead of it just being a hollow foil of one of all the other already existing Alpha Guard cards. That was pretty much darn near impossible. That said, Vapor is included in the second edition as a regular non-hollow foil card and is included in the currently being kickstarted Core Faction Expansion Set. So there is a chance to still be able to get her even if you can't find second edition. In fact, that's the case with any second edition cards that are changed for the Alpha Guard or Razor Corp. However, as I've mentioned before, that does not apply to the community. Now let's look at Razor Corp, and we don't need to look at Razor Corp neutrals because again, they are the same as what we would see for Alpha Guard and Dawn Light and Shadow Cell and Sword of Cloud Echo and Edge Hunter. So for the Razor Corp, that is the red colored faction as far as their card backs go. For the Razor Corp actions, we have 13 that exist in both sets, but we have a few that have had their little symbols tweaked, even though the card itself essentially does the same thing. So the same, we have Brainwash, Replacement, Bait and Switch, Low Hanging Fruit, Advance Your Cause, Promotion, Network, Penetration, Inside Job, and Force of Will. But then we have some symbol changes where Escape Plan goes from having this symbol that we see here for community draw to having the symbol for spy. Manipulator goes from having remove special and lasting effect, I guess because it actually moves a lasting effect around, it kind of takes it out of play, but then lets it go into another place as if that was yours or as if that was something that uh, you had played. It instead gets the same initial symbol, but then copycat instead of lasting effect, even though it is going to affect a lasting effect. Right Hand Man goes from Kill and Swap to Swap and Move, and then Subordination has the thing we just saw with Alpha Guard where it has a round effect symbol plus a round effect notation, and they just yank the round effect symbol off because the notation's already there. Then there are six Razor Corp cards that are completely swapped out where the first edition and second edition cards are completely different. First edition has Fringe Strike, Give and Take, Corrupt Strike, Sacrilegious Strike, Arm Strike, and Kill and Restore, Whereas the second edition has Neuro Merge, Hostile Takeover, Frozen Assets, Dispute Resolution, Bad Investment, and After Strike. Then for the Razor Corp Epics, we have nine that are the same between the two sets, except for that round effect symbol change. So we have Nocturne, Kill Switch, Violent Deceiver, Community Marauder, and Diabolist, then the Crafty Butcher, those are all the same, and then Double Cross, Miscalculator, and the Recruiter are effectively the same, but again, they have the round effect down here, so they don't need the symbol up here. The symbol itself is gone. Among the epics, then, there are three that are completely swapped out between editions. First edition has Reviver, Mind Swipe, and Factional Mayhem. Second edition has the Compromiser, Phobia, and Doppelganger. 
And it's the same thing with the legendaries that we saw back with Alpha Guard. We have three that are the same, though in this case, one of them has changed their art and changed their symbols around a little bit here. Then we have three that are completely new, swapped out, and then one that was only available as that random holofoil insert with no regular version from the first edition that now has a regular non-foil version in second edition that's also included in the core faction expansion set currently on Kickstarter. So what we have here that are the same, we have Deuces Wild, minor art change, but you can barely, barely see it, Dead Speak, then the one that has definitely changed artwork here significantly and moved and changed some of its symbols here is the Oracle. Then the three that have been swapped out for first edition are Red Sky, White Streak, and Third Eye. For second edition, the Scarecrow, Grim Order, and the Chairman. And then the one that was only available as a hollow foil before is Dark Scar, which is included non hollow foil in second edition. I would also note here, while we're on the subject of cards, that the little help cards for the two factions that are essentially identical except for the color scheme, have also been updated between first and second edition because by the time second edition was coming out, we already had more factions released, so they needed to include new symbols here for card effect and instant play that just didn't exist when the original game was put out in 2017. So there you have it, folks. An extensive look at Master of Wills from Stormcrest Games. Again, this is a game that I really wasn't sure about to begin with. I saw it on Kickstarter, thought it might be kind of interesting back when they were doing the Edge Hunter and 2nd Edition Kickstarter, but it might be kind of cool. Notice they had an app version that was in beta to check out. Really enjoyed the gameplay there, and I lucked out because at the time they had relatively limited supplies of the different faction expansions, and they had, therefore, only a few of these sort of all-in pledges to get all the stuff from that Kickstarter plus all the previous game materials except the first edition, the Overlord pack that hadn't come out yet, or the game map. I backed at that level, lucking out when somebody dropped the pledge, wound up picking up first edition as well, and the game map, and now I am happily backing Blood Crown in the current Kickstarter, and I've added that core faction expansion set into the mix as well. I've been lucky because the team behind the game is so supportive of those who are particularly supportive of them, which I thought is pretty cool because I'd be supportive of the game anyway because I just really like the game. So they were able to help me get my hands on those PAX promos that I was able to show you here as well. Eventually, when the Blood Crown Kickstarter does fulfill, I'll be back to show you the Blood Crown faction with its faction expansion, its Fringe War Neutral Pack, and that core faction expansion set. For now, if you're not sold on the game yet and maybe you don't want to jump into the Kickstarter, Okay, there's also the digital version that you can pick up from the App Store and Google Play. Just know that the digital game isn't an LCG type model, so there are blind booster packs in a sense, and yes, there are microtransactions involved in it. It's also relatively limited on single player right now if you tend to like to play solo against the AI. Most of the gameplay is directly with other human players, as a competitive game typically will be. So hopefully this has answered some of your questions about what to expect for Master of Wills. Hopefully if you are a completist like me, you kind of know what to be looking for at this point. I've also posted a similar article on this over on the forum for Master of Wills on Board Game Geek if you're interested in seeing it in print with the names of the individual cards being changed around. And effectively a guide for completists. Thanks for watching. Now go influence and manipulate people. Wait, that's not right, is it?